What is your life? Now, that can be answered several ways. But inspiration had James write that. What is your life? And in a moment, we'll notice specifically how James answered it. But this question, what is your life? One of those questions that tends to run through our minds from our earliest recollections when we begin to understand something about life in the flesh. And you know, it doesn't really take that long before children realize when they mature that uh, we won't be here forever. They may not understand much about it, but they get an idea. It's just part of us. And the older we get, the more we realize how brief and uncertain life is. The poet Longfellow expressed it this way. Art is short and time is fleeting and in our hearts, though true and brave. Still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. I would say he had, with the talent he had, uh, certainly the thought in his mind of what was his life. Well, what is my life? As I said, James answered that. It's a sobering question, or ought to be. But he gave only a partial answer. It's important what he says, for what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little while, then vanisheth away. James 4.14. Every time I see steam rising from boiling water, I think of this passage. And I think about that's how quickly physical life is going away. And considering the brevity of life and the speed which with it passes, Job wrote, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, Job 7, 6. I suggest that people, since we're not that familiar with what a weaver shuttle is that you go look at on Google. I mean, you know, you Google everything else. You Google a weaver shutter, shuttle. And see, even a hand-worked shuttle, as they would have had in those days, goes very fast. Job 7 and 6. How swiftly they fly, and then we're called to meet our God. Job had something to say about that, too. Man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth as a shadow and continueth not. Job 4, 1 and 2. Then in the New Testament, the apostle Peter writing to Christians said, For all flesh is his grass. And the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. 1 Peter 1.24 So we might expect that Satan would try to spin that, and he probably does it this way. That's talking about somebody else, but not me. I feel fine right now. Or I'm young, or... Whatever the case may be, even for older people, feeling pretty good. I heard and witnessed the last sermon that the late B.C. Good Pastor preached before he died. He was having uh, many strokes at that time. The doctor told him that he would do that. And after he finished his sermon that day, he got back in the pulpit and said, I want to apologize if there maybe was a place or two in my sermon that it seemed like I wasn't with it. He said, I have those TIAs, I believe that, is that what they call them, Barbara? Uh, and said, when that happens, I'm blank for maybe a second, maybe 30 seconds. I don't know when I come back to myself. And uh, you couldn't have told it. I remember Brother Wood saying after it was over, I wish he hadn't done that. That just drew attention to it. But there wasn't any attention to be drawn for the hearer. 
But a month later, he got out of his car coming to go in from his office to go to the house and drop dead of a massive stroke. But I remember him saying in that sermon at 80-something years old, he said, you know, I look in the mirror and I realize I'm old. That's not the same face looking back at me it was just a few years ago and even back. So I realized that. But, you know, I, when I think and I'm just being myself, I don't think I'm any different than I was 40 years ago. Well, that's the way we are, and that's why we can be deceived into thinking there's, there's really, you know, not much to be concerned about. And yet the Bible's saying what all the time? How brief and uncertain and fleeting life is. So what is your life? What is your life? Because this caravan of life is constantly moving, never stopping, as it moves from here to the silent city of the dead. And thus it's a mute reminder of us all. We too shall die. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, Hebrews 9.27. Here's a point that needs to be well driven home and we need to be right, reminded of. We were never meant to be here that long. Not in the flesh. And even when you look back at the time when men not that far from the tree of life were living into hundreds of years, that's not long. You say, what? Not long. Well, think about your own life you're 70 years old, you're 80 years old or whatever, it's going to buy in a hurry. Why do you think their lives slowed down? In fact, psychologists have done tests to say the longer you live, because you built up this, this knowledge you have from birth, because you don't have much to remember when you're 15. Think about it. You don't have much to remember when you're 15. You haven't been here but 15 years. What can you remember of your life? But as you mount up those years go by, things tend to go faster. And we remark on that as we get older, how the days go by faster. But it's something to do, even the psychologist says, with the accumulation of the knowledge we have over the years and the experiencing of the same things over and over again. Think about it. What do you experience in your life in the last 10 years that you didn't experience in the years before? It doesn't change. This same sermon could just as well have been preached when you were 10 as it is now that you're whatever age you are. Same sermon. And people in the audience when you were 10 that might have been 80, it would hit them the same way if they listened and understood. So we don't need to let the devil make us think that I've got plenty of time. I've got plenty of time. We just don't. Because we don't know when that time's going to end. And it will, certainly. Life is the most uncertain thing. You people that are children up through your early 20s but I'd say even up to 20 years old it seems like you're going to be here a long time I remember one time I was visiting back at a place when I, was, I remember my birthday was coming up and I was going to be 30 years old and there was a man there who had the same birthday I did and he was about to turn 50 and he smiled and looked at me and said we got the same birthday just a few years apart and he said Turn around about twice and you'll be 50. <laughs> if I live, I'll be 77 in December. I don't think I've turned around twice. <laughs> it's the way it works. And that's why James says it's a, like a vapor. It appears for a little while. So what is my life? What do I do in these few brief years I have on earth? Well, I had a lady the other day who's not a Christian. And she was telling me, my barber, in fact, she's cut my hair for years. She said, how are you feeling? I said, oh, I'm doing okay. She said, I still got the same ups and downs I always do. 
She said, well, you look real good. I said, remember the old adage, looks are deceiving. <laughs> and truly, that's the way it is a lot of times. But when we get to telling ourselves that, Especially when it comes to how much time do I have to obey the gospel? How much time do I have to show the Lord I really love him? And I appreciate with all my heart what he's done for me. And I want to trust him to where I'll obey him no matter what. And it makes you then begin to, begin to realize how easy the devil can use the way it works on this earth in the flesh to get us to think. And yet I, I promise you this. Those of you who are still considered young chronologically, I don't mean young mentally. There may be, you may be kind of old and still be young in your desires and activities. You're going to remember what I say now, but you're going to only remember it when you're many years older. You turn around about twice, so to speak, figurative manner of speaking, and you will be 50. And you may be 50 and have not yet obeyed the gospel of Christ because you believe this business of I've got plenty of time. What is your life? Can you honestly before God in the light of the Bible say to yourself, here is my life? Because really a life not dedicated to Christ by obedience to the gospel is not really doing anybody much good, but especially the person who refuses to obey the gospel. Boast not thyself tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring, Proverbs 27, 1. Is that true? Well, of course it is. Even people who don't believe in God would probably say that's true. And as we talk about the rich farmer, it takes a fool to tear down and build bigger barns to store tomorrow's harvest in it while ignoring the providential care of our God. Life is uncertain. And death is sure is an adage that man has proved too many times for us to ignore it. And thus we come down to this said by the psalmist, that life is a tale, or we spend our days as a tale that is told. Then you know what he says? Now this is especially for those of you past 70 and the others who hope to get to 70, maybe. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. I think I've seen more doctors since I turned 70 than I did ever before in my life, especially at one time. Well, I reached the three score, but I knew the latter part of this when I reached three score. And on my mind, when I turned 70, I thought, well, the labor and sorrow is starting now. <laughs> I'm certainly on borrowed time. Because then he says, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Psalm 99 through 10. All through the Old Testament, there are statements like this. All through the New Testament, it's taught. But we continue to live our lives asking, what is the importance of life? What is your life? Well, it has to fit in between the time that we start this life and the time we quit this life. We don't have long to get ready. Oh, yeah, but I'm going to live to be 100. You know, like they say, well, 80 nowadays is 60 or 50 years ago. In what sense? Because of modern medicine and hygiene and food and all that stuff, we're living longer. Well, that's all well and good. But for most people from 60 on, if they get that far, 
they're already, as they used to say back home, shot in their ways. And you don't get many of them. And all my preaching career of 58 years, I guess now, the oldest person I've ever baptized was a man who was 66 years old up in the mountains of Arkansas in a gospel meeting. You know the ages of most of the people that we baptize. They're in their teens. Sometimes on into their 20s and maybe early 30s, but it starts sliding away after that. But time hasn't slid away. It's still rushing fast. It's going by in a hurry. Young people have a hard time realizing that some of us know better, of course, through experience. Of when they're still with their parents, their parents are active and lively. Well, you know, they don't ever think of them being gone, and yet you realize they'll, if they live a normal life, they'll be gone a lot longer, their parents will, than, than they realize, than the time they were with them. And grandchildren in particular, they're around their grandparents if all goes well. And they have a hard time of realizing that most of their life they're going to live and their grandparents won't be around. We see it, in other words, what we witness, experience on every hand says, you don't have long. You don't have long. No matter how many years you stack up, you don't have long. One thing that must be remembered and we must be reminded of it, and again, talk about fundamental matters this morning, we're talking about fundamental matters now in Christian living. We're talking about a state of the mind that must be cultivated and kept. Life is not measured by material things. Take heed, Jesus said, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Luke 12, 15. And then, of course, it's our Lord who warned us of the deceitfulness of riches, Mark 4, 19. There's just no evidence, in fact, it's the contrary, that riches alone or possessions guarantee any kind of real happiness. Why is the Scrooge story of the Christmas Carol, why is that so popular still? The message is still the same. We keep what we give away and use for proper purposes. We lose anything we, we hold on to. And some of the world's greatest men have lived in abject poverty. We won't have time to go into all of them, but uh, as far as what the world considers great, someone like Socrates had nothing as far as of this world's good. But a greater than he comes, and that's Jesus, and he simply says to his disciples, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, Matthew 8, 20. I think that probably tells us why he said work for the night is coming. There's an end to opportunity. And however long we're on this earth in possession of our faculties and able, it's all the time we've got to do the thing God expects us to do, which is fear him and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Here's what Paul wrote. Speaking of Christ, he said, For your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And it was Jesus who said, I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. These are things that make us realize that we, we put the emphasis all too often on too many things that are simply not abiding, that are simply not life quality or, or add real genuine, as the Bible would picture it, quality to life. You'll remember it was Peter and John after the resurrection who went up to the temple and found the lame man. He looked at him and thought that they were going to, he was going to receive a, alms and yet Peter said silver and gold have I none such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk Acts 3 
Now, question. Would you contend that Peter and John didn't have a full life and they were enjoying it abundantly even in the midst of persecutions and no money? Thus we realize again a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Life is far more than food and raiment. We learn that from the rich man, Luke 16. We see exactly where he ended up. But the man who had nothing, representing the faithful servant of God, Lazarus, sick, laid at the rich man's gate full of sores. The dogs came and licked his sores. He had nothing. And the rich man paid no attention to him. He desired the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. But when he dies, as Abraham tells the rich man, he's comforted. So is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Matthew 6, 25. So Jesus taught us then in the early part of the Sermon on the Mount, and the scriptures back it all up in different ways throughout the past, throughout the Testament, the New Testament, not to be anxious for that which we eat and drink. Or where God will supply it to us if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 31 and 34. Sometimes we get a little beside ourselves, Abraham and Sarah, as we studied last Wednesday night, because Sarah suggested that uh, that promise God had made to Abraham that he would be a great nation through his descendants needed some help, and so they got together and she suggested Hagar, her handmaid, be given to Abraham, and Abraham and Hagar have a child, and it would be through who, the man who became Ishmael, or the babe who was called Ishmael, that there's the way God would do it. Well, we get kind of a sigh. Why couldn't they have waited and been patient? Well, it's always easy to look at it outside. But when it comes then to the church and our seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us, we like to give God a little help too. Because we can't see how he's going to do this or he's going to do that. We have all these sermons and all these readings from the Old Testament about God providing. You know how he did it? I don't know. What was on Abraham's mind when he was about to slay his son at the command of God. Abraham said, will you? He'll raise up, right of Hebrew says, from the ashes and perform the promises then through Isaac that he said he would. But that wasn't the way God chose to do it. There's a ram caught in a thicket and with a aged father's outstretched arm about to plunge the knife, so to speak, into his son. He stayed his hand, and they offered what God provided. And Abraham and Isaac, now the one, had a thing to do with that ram being right there at that time with his horns caught in a thicket. How'd God do that? I assure you, written before time for our learning, that if that is the case, what he said in Matthew 6, 33, and all these things shall be added unto you, conditional promise, if you put the kingdom of God and his righteous first, he can do it today. I've lived long enough to see those things transpire. But I believed them before I saw them happening. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 6, 17, 10, 17. A lot of folks, and this is especially in America, we want to gratify our lusts. Solomon dissipated himself, as we were studying in the ladies' class, in a way that nobody else could because he had the wherewithal to do whatever he wanted. He searched for Worldly entertainment, sensual lusts were filled. His view was all of that's pointless, all of it's vanity. Now listen to this in Ecclesiastes 11.9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, 
And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Ecclesiastes 11, 9. And then when you come to the end of the book, the conclusion is there. Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, if I'm to ask myself, what is my life? Don't you think these things ought to be heavy on my mind every day? That I can review and examine myself and see where am I headed? What is my life worth to God? Now, there's the ending of the whole thing. What is my life worth? right to this present time, been worth to my Lord and Savior who suffered, bled, and died? What do my beliefs and actions say to God about how much I care about that? We participate in songs that many times extol God and the love of God, how much we appreciate God and Christ for all they did. But then really what we do during the day as to practicing the truth of day-to-day -day Christian living, what does it really say? So these are things that cause us to begin to say, well, there is a successful life. There is a life that can be lived to please God and where my life is worth something. I sometimes get amazed. I see these people... especially entertainers who have lived all kinds of worldliness in their lives and they're, they've been involved totally in a sensual approach to life and fame and all of this kind of thing. But you know, as they get older, have you ever noticed what a lot of them do? They start looking for something that they think to give them meaning to life. I think of it a lot of times uh, they go to contributing thousands of dollars to save the dogs or something. That there's a void. When they've asked, what is my life? It was more than a game show. It was more than whatever. They want something. Of course, they know nothing about the gospel and how to live life to serve God. But there's that yearning to do something good for somebody else, even if it is a dog. So you see them doing that kind of thing. I don't know whether any of you have seen this, but I'm going to close on this story. It ties in the same thing I just got through saying. But on YouTube, they've had, and I forgot what they call them now, but it's where they have got together. I think they must have done it 10, 15 years ago. I don't know if they're still doing it or not. But they got together a lot of the old that were old at that time, many of them are dead now, of the uh, country western singers. And many of them at the time they recorded these things were quite old. Well, some of them were famous for the most uh, honky-tonk beer joint songs in the world. That's how they got famous. They got pretty wealthy off of it. And I don't know how many of them sitting there, now past their prime, now past the times they were really drawing the crowds. And some of them can still sing pretty good at that age. Some of them know they can't. As I say, most of these I've watched, many of them have been dead for years now, but they're there. I don't know how many of them talk about finding the Lord. And in the same breath, they may sing a song that still extols the, the honky-tonk. But they're looking for something. They've asked him their question, what is my life? One of them reported, and you, some of you won't ever heard of him because he died in the early 60s, but he was a very famous country western singer, Red Foley. And one of them talked about one time, who was a good friend of him, and this fellow's dead now. But he said Foley got him aside and was talking to him one time when they were on a show somewhere, several of them on it. And he broke down crying, talking about all of the bad things he had done in his life. Now, there's several of them on this thing that will talk about things they did and they knew better. And they're being, their conscience is eating on him is what's happening. 
They know they did those things that weren't acceptable. Many of them talk about the bout with drinking whiskey and it's uh, and the stuff they got into and all that and how they learned better than that now and all this kind of thing. There is set within every one of us that eternity that God put there because we're made in the image of God. And there is when we really sit down where we can meditate and think, it comes out. If we don't know the Bible or anything, it's still going to come out in the way that it can. In other words, people can live their lives haunted by what they did not do they should have done and the wicked things they did they shouldn't have done because they, ha they don't understand how to, how to be forgiven of that, where to be held against you no more because all sin, of course, ultimately is against God, no matter who else is involved. So there's a wonderful life available to all of us, a successful life. But it comes only through fully realizing your duty to the Almighty. How that you can accept His grace. As we said earlier today, salvation has been brought down. But so many people don't know it. Those are yearning. And we in the church should be cultivating people in such a way as it makes them think what they normally don't want to think of because Satan's going to try to get them not to think about it. If, if you're trying to justify yourself in whatever sin or sins it may be, you will do your best not to think about what you've done. You'll do your best not to. That's the reason people need to have it pulled out and set before them. Remember the old television show, This Is Your Life? That's what they need put before them. Is this you? Be honest now before God who knows your heart and you know yourself. Is this you right now? Is it a life worth living? Is God pleased with your life? Only you can really answer that among men as to just what it is that you need that will satisfy you spiritually. Well, I don't have to know the exact thoughts of your mind to know that if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you stand condemned before God. So we always urge people, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Don't harden your heart. Obey the gospel. So if you need to do that, now's the time to do it. As a child of God, if you sin, now's the time to take care of that. Repent of those sins. Confess them. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.